Day 1002 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 727 thousand military personnel losses, representing an additional 1,510 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, 8 tanks, 24 APVs, 50 artillery, and 2 air defense systems. Then headed straight to the map with new developments in the Russo-Ukrainian war, or really any war for that matter. As the Ukrainian Air Force has just confirmed that Russia struck the Ukrainian city of Dnipro with a conventionally armed ICBM this morning marking the first combat use of an ICBM in history. ICBM, of course, standing for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. With the footage from Dnipro showing the glowing re-entry, hitting the ground at around 5am local time. Now, as I said, it's the first time in history, and that doesn't sound right. Well, historically, ICBMs have been developed and maintained as strategic deterrents, primarily designed to deliver nuclear warheads over long distances. Their deployment has been limited to testing alongside deterrence during periods of geopolitical tension without actual use in combat scenarios. This event is surely not likely to go down well with the international community at all. So the warheads in the missile used, about a half a dozen, were non-nuclear, thus conventional warheads, at a weight of about 250 kilograms each. And with an accuracy of this missile type at about 90 meters to 250 meters CEP, or circular error probable, making for strikes in this theater potentially absolutely inaccurate. And judging from some of these vehicles, more likely to be a CEP of 500 to 1000 meters, even seeming to hit an object such as a football stadium. In some of the footage, you see the several warheads land in a truly post-apocalyptic kind of way. With the use of this inaccurate weapon, which is not only negligent, it's knowingly disregarding of the potential for immense collateral damage as it's simply not designed to hit with the precision needed to strike at the civilian infrastructure it's presumably targeting. And again, this will be internationally condemned, likely leading to a whole further matrix of issues for Russia. And I'll provide more on this story as it develops. Then to Kursk with another significant update on battlefield dynamics, as British-made Storm Shadow missiles strike Russian military targets in the region, reportedly targeting a key communications hub and military bunker in the village of Marinko, less than 40 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. Russian military telegrammers and other local sources point to 12 Storm Shadow missiles used, with drone footage revealing multiple impacts on the facility, suggesting a high-value target and potential command post for Russian and North Korean troops, which means the AFU can hardly get a more legitimate target. Russian media outlets posted some images of what they claim remains of the targeting location, with the now technically decades old technology of the Storm Shadows first produced in the late 1990s that puts on display the lack of Russian modern air defenses in this critical region. Meanwhile, Russian media is starting to get in a bit of a panic over the use of the Storm Shadow missiles and really any missile tech Ukraine operates after receiving from their security partners. You see, the causal factor here was Russia escalating tensions by deploying North Korean weapons and troops, with the troops' involvement especially that drew sharp Western pushback deemed highly provocative, that led the West to bolster Ukraine with authorization of weapons like the Attackums and Storm Shadows in the Kursk territory. And it's not just the Russian media in a frenzy, it's their military as well, now realizing that they can be hit by speed and precision anywhere within this oblast at any given time. Then as for more news for this region, North Korea dispatches Colonel General Kim Yong-bok, a key military figure and aide to Kim Jong-un, to lead its troops in Kursk of Russia, as confirmed by officials in Seoul and Kyiv. Reports indicate that this colonel is tasked with integrating North Korean forces with Russian troops and adapting combat experiences for future deployments. 
makes perfect sense. With countless stories now on the failed integration between the two armies, with one situation going as far as to have several Russian soldiers shot at by North Korean soldiers, because all the Russians could successfully do to teach or communicate to the North Korean soldiers was to man this trench and shoot anything that comes your way. What a blunder. So now it would really appear that this Colonel General Kim Yong-bok is being called in effectively as damage control. Then moving on, still within this location of the map as related to the actual frontline engagements as intense fighting unfolded with Ukraine's SOF. Their special operations forces eliminating 100 enemy combatants reportedly within just one hour and seizing 26 Russian prisoners of war during a heated battle where two fighters from the Russian Storm Z unit shared their harrowing story of transformation from prisoners to soldiers only to find themselves surrendering after a brief stint on the front lines. We also saw how a Russian soldier stationed in the Kursk direction reports the discovery of a quote new type of mine that's been deployed by Ukrainian forces with them asserting that its effectiveness surpasses that of the notorious petal or butterfly mine. This one seems to be some sort of pressure sensitive or proximity activated electronically detonated battery powered anti-personnel mine or IED. And above all, quite problematic for Putin's army that has been instructed to keep on the attack as an attempt to take back the region. Then headed down on the map to potentially the hottest spot on the front lines, Karakova, where the Russian forces continue to operate out of Danli, with a strong operational focus on the south of this direction, as mentioned previously. Interestingly, for this region, a Ukrainian unit from the 79th Air Assault Brigade seized a crucial position without the specifics as yet on precisely where for this direction. And in this meticulously planned operation, they stealthily infiltrated Russian lines, taking out a unit commander and deputy while capturing three infantrymen. Then headed west on the map with information coming out of Zerbankiye in the Zaporizhia Oblast where the AFU were said to have made some significant strides, which we should later see on the map updates. And so based on these reports, in the least, this area is grey zoned, or beyond that, taken under full AFU control. Then on this part of the map, and just a day before that, somewhere on these front lines, Ukrainian forces launched airstrikes using their GBU-39 guided munitions, targeting Russian bunkers filled with ammunition as we more and more see these GBU-39s making a comeback. They can be aviation launched, as was the case with this one, or, in fact, launched from a HIMARS platform. Then to take a look around on the map, because somewhere in the east, the 14th Separate Regiment successfully targets and destroys a Russian Book M2 air defense system with a Switchblade 600 Kamikaze drone. Secondary explosions ensued as the book's armament lit up. Those Switchblades really appear to be making a comeback as well. Now, Ukraine received the 300 series from the US almost upon commencement of the full-scale invasion, with these 600 series arriving not long after, and were something that I have to say were really quite specced up and impressive for their time, including a range of up to 40 kilometers or 25 miles, a 40-minute endurance, and a payload size of almost 17 pounds. Then also in the east, and an event from yesterday I wanted to show you guys, so a Ukrainian tank that was equipped with a new electronic warfare system was shown to have successfully neutralized a Russian kamikaze drone. The moment the drone got close enough, it lost connection with its operator and nailed itself to the ground a short distance away during its terminal phase. Then also in the east, on a slightly different angle, Russian channels are buzzing with the news about the new Ukrainian brigades now receiving heavy equipment that was previously out of reach. Specifically, they mentioned that there was previously light infantry Ukrainian brigades in the north and south, where they considered them to be low on manpower and heavy armored equipment. But now those brigades have, in their words, transitioned to mechanized brigades, suggesting further trained and deployed personnel, as well as better resourced brigades that they hadn't seen or expected before. With them also making the point that this aligns with the 20 Bradley vehicles recently spotted in Romania, and aligns with reports of Western equipment production ramp-ups. 
Then also, we saw how a Russian ZSTS Akhmat armored vehicle experiences an accident in the Belgorod region, managing to flip over on highway traffic. The vodka is strong with this one. Don't drink and drive, folks. Then headed across to some news, so Germany announces a substantial new military aid package for Ukraine, showcasing continued support in the ongoing conflict. The delivery includes critical assets such as air surveillance, radars, self-propelled howitzers, a wide array of reconnaissance drones, all for bolstering Ukraine's defense capabilities. Then in some more news, Denmark announced a $138 million financial aid package to boost Ukraine's missile and drone production, reinforcing their support amidst the ongoing conflict. Danish PM Fredriksen also visited Kyiv, emphasizing the impact of such investments on the battlefield. Then on the topic of Ukrainian homegrown production, Ukraine has recently increased production of the R-360 Neptune cruise missiles, now capable of longer range strikes, according to Ukrainian Defense Minister Umarov. And with 100 missiles produced this year alone, the country is ramping up its missile capabilities, but is also expected to be producing no less than four missile types, comprised of various ranges and designs for various mission profiles. Not the least of which is for deep penetrating strikes into Moscow. Did I say Moscow? I meant Russia. With a range reported to reach up to and beyond Moscow itself. Then headed to some further Russian economy news, as the Russian economy faces significant challenges with central bank head Nabilina admitting that the RCB has nearly exhausted its resources. In a parliamentary address, she highlights alarming levels of labor shortages alongside concerns of inflation not subsiding. Also that factory production has hit its limits and that nearly 90% of enterprises face labor shortages, plus a slowing GDP growth, a growth mind you that exists only because of the Kremlin's spending on defense now. But then further concerns on the economic front for the raising of interest rates beyond the already 21%. And now we see reports of a whopping 40% of next year's budget allocated to defense, even as many Russian suppliers are already voicing their concerns about overdue payments for past deliveries, while corporations brace for a wave of bankruptcies due to financial strain in 2025. This is quite the quick take here, but all signs seem to point to an impending economic collapse for Russia. And gee, with so much stressful news as far as the Russian economy goes, so headed to something a little bit lighter, maybe even a little bit funny, as Russian military bloggers have a suggestion to help faltering air defenses, which is to get access to some of those air defenses from all of Putin's residences. Of which Putin appears to be, in a way, stockpiling dozens, multiple dozens of air defense systems, some of the best that Russia has to offer. Ah, bunker boy paranoid Putin. But I love how the Russians start out their request here, and I prefer to paraphrase here rather than quote, with them saying, We certainly share the strongest of concerns for the safety and well-being of our dearly beloved president. But maybe if you could perhaps find it in your heart to give us some spares of those many air defenses hanging around your homes, plural. We couldn't even imagine life without our great leader. But pretty please protect us from a war that is entirely not your fault. Good luck with that request. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe, support, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.